ocean. Its waves pound on one of the most popular stretches of the South African coastline. Millions of tourists flock here annually, in spite of its notorious reputation. Local beaches provide a paradise for water sport lovers from all over the world. Its mysterious depths, full of life and capped by huge waves, are a mecca for young surfers. These waters are irresistible in spite of the ever-present threat of a predator with a terrifying reputation. One of the most feared and mysterious creatures on our planet. In 1998, 15-year-old surfer Mark Yucker was attacked by a shark near Port Elizabeth. Ryan Johnson, a keen marine biology student, is interested in cases such as these as a part of his research on great white sharks. Shark activity is monitored along the entire South African coastline, and Ryan makes a point of visiting many of these shark hotspots in person. This time, he's traveling east to Mossel Bay. It's a 150 kilometer journey from Clainby, but Ryan is enjoying the countryside. It reminds him of his New Zealand homeland. Ryan decides to take a bird's eye view of this surface paradise. The young scientist is sure that the intense surf zone is one of the reasons why sharks are so active here. Most attacks take place very close to beaches such as this. Ryan wants to find out why. The bay offers locals a beautiful beach with pristine sparkling water. Perfect, except for the great whites. Ryan is convinced that these waters provide the sharks with ideal conditions for taking it easy. The predators rise slowly to the surface, often just beyond the breaking waves. Here they can lie in wait for hours, possibly resting. This is the first time the phenomenon has been observed. This is the home of internationally respected shark expert Andre Hartmann. Scientists, filmmakers, and photographers from all over the world are keen to share Andre's knowledge and experience. His exceptional sensitivity and instinct allow him to cross the imaginary divide between safety and jaws. Free diving, it became a story for me to, to find out more about them. So you, you sort of push the envelope every time a little more. You get a little bit closer, you start touching them, you pull on the pectoral fin and touch the tail, touch their body, and you feel, you can feel when you touch the body, there's like a muscle spasm going, I can feel the touch. It's, they're like jittery, it's almost like you're tickling them. I'm not comfortable with that. Andre knows how to lure sharks towards cameramen and set up the best shots. Totally familiar with the local conditions, Andre really understands the behavior of these animals. Few television documentaries about great whites have been made without Hartman's assistance. I think the sharks see me as another predator. I think the, the chum makes him think the boat is the food. 
and the piece of bait that we have hanging off the back is a piece that's broken off. They're more interested in the boat than really the bait, but they'll go for that piece because it's smaller. But you'll find that they, they want to bite the corners of the boat, they want to bite the engines, they want to see if they can bite a piece off. And if you're in the water with them, they treat you as, one of the, as another predator trying to feed on the same thing they're feeding on, and they leave you alone. You're much safer that way than if you go spearfishing on your own outside there, you're hanging on the surface alone like a lone seal swimming. And you know how they take them out like that? And that's the problem, that's, that's the only problem I have with them, is that you, when you're on your own, you can be taken out quite quickly. It is early morning. Andre is returning earlier than expected from an inspection tour of Giza Island, known for its dense seal population. Visibility is not ideal for shark cage diving, and Andre spends the morning with Ryan, who has returned from Mossel Bay. They go through archival videos in Andre's house and analyze shark behavior in various situations. Okay, looks at that guy's fin. He looks up, he's right next to them. And this guy's sure. got the dry suit and he's very buoyant. He keeps bouncing around. But he's not at all interested in the yellow guy. You know, I thought the yellow would attract him more. But he's not, he's not worried about the yellow guy, he's worried about the shiny blue fin. Some moments defy standard diving procedure, even on Andre's terms. Look how he looks at those fins. First the one, then the other. On this unique occasion, the shark took a liking to one of the cameraman's fins. I think this is it here, maybe. Uh, look at him, look at that fin. And, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, you gotta watch it again. It's gonna go oh, back. Oh, goodness. Back a little bit and I'm gonna slow it down. He bit him. Clearly not interested in the diver, it eventually took a bite only of the diver's fin and not his leg. Oh, goodness. Was it possible that the silver sheen to the fin reminded the shark of fleeing fish? The next day, visibility is poor again. Andre and Ryan make the best of their time by surface viewing. Today, they need to attach small transmitters to free swimming sharks. These are part of an automated monitoring system which Ryan has helped establish. Tagged transmitters will send back information about shark movements to special receivers placed on the seafloor in areas where great whites tend to congregate. The sharks cooperate, and the young researcher manages to place the miniature transmitters on their backs. This experimental monitoring system is excellent, but there is one problem. Depositing the receiver onto the sea floor means diving into a very dangerous place. Without Andre's help, this would be impossible. Although sharks have become Ryan's job, he has yet to meet them in open water and is understandably nervous. Finally, the weather improves. Part of Ryan's studies take him to nearby Port Elizabeth, and he plans to visit Bird Island, a known hotspot for great white sharks. The spirit of Millennium is comfortable and spacious. The experienced crew has been looking forward to this trip for a long time. They've been waiting for favorable weather, and finally, it has arrived. Uh, port Control, Port Control, Spirit Millennium, requesting permission to leave half over. Even though the aim of this trip is great white sharks, they are sailing towards rocks completely covered with penguins, cormorants, and seagulls. The morning sun glitters on the sea surface and a mild wind augurs an easy run. Ryan can see himself crossing the entire Indian Ocean on this beautiful boat.
The Millennium crew carefully studies the cliffs around Bird Island and selects a suitable anchoring position. The heavy anchor settles on the rocky bottom. Bird calls echo from a distance. Ryan knows that penguins look awkward on the ground, but they are fast and agile underwater. Unless a shark manages to take a penguin by surprise, it's not an easy bird to catch. Sharks occasionally come here to investigate strange flightless birds and leave their telltale call sign, a crescent-shaped scar. One of Ryan's tasks is to find penguins that show the scars of such shark bites. This will help the researcher establish whether any sharks have been in the area recently. The island's inhabitants resent the intrusion. Some make a beeline for the water. Ryan radios the mothership. He wants to know if the crew has recorded any white shark activity. Okay, keep waiting. Standing by. Apparently a small white shark has been nosing around the ship for the past hour. It has even found a feathered friend. <laughs> The giant petrel, always hungry, has lost its sense of humor today. First all these persistent seagulls, and now this one has joined in. Back on board, the crew start preparing bait. Now is the time to find out if the real master of the ocean is around. Today's special is tuna heads, sardines and shark liver. No predator in the world would miss such a tempting cocktail. Everybody is hoping that the sharks will take to it. Ryan doesn't seem to like the smell, and even the penguin appears to share his opinion. After a brief consultation with his stomach, Ryan reports back for duty. Today, one of his tasks is to recover a sample of shark tissue, which will be sent to the University of Aberdeen for a detailed laboratory analysis. Before long, the first donor arrives, lured by the promise of food. Even though the shark appears to be calm, recovering its tissue without hurting it requires experience and great skill. This large female stays smart and deep beneath the surface, well out of reach of the tagging pole. Ryan knows he has only one chance. He can't afford to waste it. Yeah, 
<laughs> Finally, the effort pays off. The valuable sample is put in a container with alcohol and information about the donor is carefully recorded. Despite occasional bouts of seasickness caused by the rocking vessel, the young biologist is satisfied. Back in Khans Bay, Andre has also been successful. The weather is cooperative and so are the sharks. Professional and amateur photographers are getting what they paid for. A fantastic show. With every Hartman nudge, the shark seems to want to show off more and more. Everyone who has met this South African shark shaman agrees on one thing. They've all shared moments with him that they'll never forget. Sometimes you get to meet a real fighter and he'll give you a real show, says Andre. It's just a little game of ours. When Toothy gets bored, he simply disappears and doesn't come back, he adds. During the evenings, Ryan continues to study cases of shark attack victims. He believes that most attacks are motivated by curiosity and inquisitiveness, rather than malice. However, in a few unique cases, the motivation may be hunting. He believes that sharks adopt a hit-first, ask-questions-later approach. In this case, the shark's advanced sensory array may be fooled. A case of mistaken identity? Ryan decides to check out his theory of sharks attacking something that only resembles a seal. He hopes his experiment will provide some evidence for his theories on the predator strategies of the great white. Andre and Ryan have assembled something from a thick black rubber that looks like a seal. Ryan attaches a polyvinyl string. He pulls this flat and reels out a strangely moving rubber dummy behind the dinghy. The rest is left up to the shark's imagination and the crew's patience. That's about far enough to just tie it off, mate. They are moving in an area with a dense seal population. And Ryan believes that if a shark sees this model, it will provoke a strike.
predator doesn't disappoint them. Believing that it has just caught an injured seal, it bites the fake victim ferociously and leaves one of its teeth behind as a souvenir for the crew. The picturesque village of Clainby is waking up to a beautiful morning. All the boat crews licensed for shark cage diving are preparing for a busy day. It is also a special day for Ryan. He's going to dive with Andre in Shark Alley near Dyer Island. They will try to maintain an essential part of his monitoring system. The mini transmitters on the shark's back can't function without a receiver. It's got one vulnerable point, and that is over there. So just be careful, yeah. Ryan hopes that this dangerous mission will go smoothly. Well, normally, in this temperature water, the, you know, the coldness of the water. Everything is ready for installation, but most important is the courage to enter these dangerous waters. Ryan has been studying sharks for many years, but he's never had a chance to dive with them. They find the spot quickly and concentrate on working fast. A shark could turn up at any time. After a couple of minutes, they encounter their first problem. The bolts for attaching the receiver don't fit, and Andre has to go back up to the boat. Ryan tries to concentrate fully on holding the receiver. His stomach knots and he suspects that he's not alone in the ocean. Waiting for Andre is like eternity. Seconds pass like hours. Finally, Andre returns. He has seen the shark. It's time to hurry. It takes time to attach the receiver. The giant female homes in on the intruders in her kingdom. While the shark is patrolling, they cannot risk surfacing and exposing themselves to the shark on the surface. Ryan keeps on repeating to himself Andre's advice. When the shark comes, never let it out of your sight. Don't be afraid, and if you are, don't show it. Their great white has been circling them for 45 minutes. In the end, its curiosity satisfied, it disappears into the blue-green semi-darkness. Ryan travels to Port Elizabeth. He has a meeting with surfer Mark Yoka. Ryan wants to know the details about Mark's unfortunate encounter. They meet on the beach where several years ago Mark nearly lost his life. The young surfer describes his terrifying ordeal. There's no doubt about it in my mind that I was lucky. Though it was a miracle, if not one or two, like when I lost my board, that my board popped up next to me, um, that the shark didn't come back and attack me. I mean, 
you see on my board where where it hit my board was it was basically inches away from my elbow bone and that the shark when it when it bit it basically just ripped my tricep out tore my whole tricep off my arm yeah this was the chunk that it bit out that whole chunk it took it right out my friend actually found it later on the beach it washed up <coughs> you can see yeah, you can see how it bit around there see how it bit into there thing with a white shark bite as you look for the very distinctive bite because that they have this classical semicircular bite Ryan studies the shark bite in detail. He can easily imagine what would have happened to Mark had the shark struck his body. It's basically, yeah, I'd be lying like that on my board and you can see that's, and what I was doing, I was lying on my board like this and stroking with this hand and obviously kicking. And I mean, you can see, look how close that is to Mark. So this has just been up here? Yeah. All I needed was that. Yeah, and that's what I was saying. Even though Mark has survived a traumatic encounter with a great white, Ryan makes him an interesting offer to visit Kleinby and Andre and to come face to face with his nemesis again. See, the positive side is to come down to Hansby and go cage diving with a friend of mine, Andre Hartman. Mark tries to suppress his excitement and accepts the offer immediately. The Indian Ocean gives another demonstration of its power. It's waiting time again. Mark's experiment in Klangbai has also been postponed. Ryan and Andre have to leave immediately. The Natal Sharks Board have recovered a great white shark in their nets, 120 kilometers out of Durban. It apparently has one of Ryan's transmitters attached to its body. Meanwhile, Mark makes a trip to the local aquarium. He knows that sand tiger sharks are nowhere near as dangerous as great whites. Nevertheless, he watches them with great respect and prepares himself mentally for his big day. The deceased shark arrives at the Natal Sharks Board Institute in Durban. Ryan's transmitter and ID tag are still attached, and his task now is to gather as much information about the specimen as possible. The miniature transmitter on its body is an important asset. Ryan and Andre are led into a laboratory for the autopsy it could provide clues as to the last days of this specimen's life. The shark, a female, looks very thin, almost as if it hadn't made any recent kills. The autopsy will confirm this. Ryan suggests taking the transmitter off the body first. Comparing his notes with information from the transmitter, he'll be able to recognize which shark it was and where it was tagged. First, the liver is removed. It represents an unbelievable 18% of the shark's body weight. Without extracting huge amounts of liver, 
it is impossible to reach the creature's heart. This is followed by an examination of the stomach contents. The stomach is completely empty. A surprising discovery, considering the great white's prowess as a hunter. Now it's Mark's turn. Ryan had told him yesterday that the weather had improved and that Andre was ready to set sail. Mark takes leave of his mother, who is fully aware of what her son is in for. She also knows that this is his own personal decision. Only he knows why. From Port Elizabeth, the journey will take Mark at least seven hours. He's in no hurry. He has a lot to think about. When he finally sees the Hanspai road sign, he feels a tremor of excitement. He knows that his meeting with a great white shark is very near. Andre and Ryan welcome Mark as if they were old friends. How's Mark? How's it, Andre? How are you doing? Heard a lot about you. A large number of safety cages catch Mark's eye. Now he can really feel that this is where the great white shark encounters happen. Shark got into the cage. Andre tests Mark's sense of humor by uh, recounting some dramatic this moments this he's experienced with these animals. This in. On this occasion, two American tourists requested a safety cage yeah. with an opening large enough to accommodate a professional camera. And the guys could see this thing and they went down and more down and eventually were lying on the bottom and the shark was really coming in, his face smashing across the inside of the cage. And it pulled one of the regulators of one of the guy's mouths. And then he had, he had no air, so he had to go out for air. So he was quite clever, he pushed the shark neatly away and then ducked out of one of the windows. And as he got out, he climbed up the top and the other guy took his cue, saw what happened took his cue and then jumped out another way. And I, of course, was outside the cage. The behavior of these amazing, mysterious creatures is unpredictable. Everyone agrees on that point. Mark listens uneasily, but soon realizes that he's in good hands. Andre suggests setting out the next day so that they can spend the afternoon studying the program for tomorrow. It's pretty lively around Giza Island today. Thousands of playful seals romp around in the placid waves. The recent storm has prevented them from swimming out, so now they're making up for lost time. Ryan's receiver near the rocks is still a novelty for them. Their curiosity gets the better of them. But too much fun and games is risky business in these waters. Innocent games often degenerate into a race for life. This seal has succeeded in severely biting its enemy during their struggle. Sharks have two vulnerable spots, eyes and gills. If wounded there, they often give up and let the seal go. But even so, the seal's injuries are serious. And in Shark Alley, there are always predators fascinated by torn bodies. Its chances of survival are next to none. At last, Mark's great day arrives. The weather is good. Joining Mark, there will also be an experienced shark cameraman on board. Andre and the cameraman will have an unusual task today. They want to film the sharks in open water, unencumbered by the protection of a safety cage. If visibility is good, they'll also retrieve one of Ryan's receivers. Mark will be watching from the safety cage, which is already on board. Come on, come on, hop on, hop on. 
Tifa. How are you? My old friend, I'm okay. The excellent weather has put everyone in a good mood. Mark checks the cage. Will it prove solid enough? Everything is ready, and the boat sets off for the area with the highest density of great white sharks in the world. Over the past 10 years, these predators have put Dyer Island firmly on the map. The first stop after the island is devoted to Mark. There's a good chance of fine visibility here, and maybe even a rendezvous from the depths. Preparation of shark liver and fish guts has become routine for Andre. Today, he's taken extra care with his choice of bait. Unlike tuna blood, which often makes great whites aggressive, shark livers keep the sharks interested, but relaxed. With the help of the chum, the liver's oil floats across the surface, creating a chum slick covering several kilometers. It doesn't take long for the first inquisitive shark to show up. This shark isn't the largest, but Andre gives Mark a sign to get ready, just in case Junior hangs around the boat long enough. Ryan decides to join Mark. He believes his friend will feel better if they stick together. The shark is still there, and Andre urges Mark to hurry things up. Suddenly, Andre spots a huge female. No one else has seen it. Andre hesitates, but in the end, lets Ryan and Mark into the water. Mark Yoka plucks up courage. He knows he's about to come face to face with the mythical creature that nearly killed him five years before. seems so beautiful, majestic, and so calm. Mark is thrilled to see this perfect predator from close up. His perceptions of a ferocious, mindless killing machine evaporate forever. But with two flicks of its tail, the shark springs to life. The predator reveals itself in all its greatness and strength. Mark experiences tense moments in the cage but he's carried away by the encounter. It exceeds his wildest expectations. The time has come to move on to Shark Alley, closer to Dyer Island. Everyone except Mark will dive there. Ryan will be able to retrieve his receiver, gaining vital information on the movements of tagged sharks. Andre's boat stops alongside a strange floating mass, a dead southern right whale. It's impossible to establish the cause of its death, but everyone can see who's responsible for the pieces of flesh and blubber missing from its body. A 
A couple of great white sharks ignore the boat and continue to carve up the whale's rotting remains. Andre moves the boat to within an arm's reach of the decomposing whale, but the crew are having trouble reconciling this with their lunch. When the shark sinks its teeth into the entrails, it's too much even for Hartman. on and everybody starts breathing fresh air again. With the help of GPS navigation, they locate Ryan's receiver. Andre wastes no time and dives in to check for visibility. Good visibility is vital here. He's delighted. Conditions couldn't be better. Young Mark may be about to witness the meeting of a great white shark with a human being in the open sea. Up until now, he's only heard about these brave men. He's never dreamed of seeing them in action himself. Just as Andre and the cameraman reach the receiver, the guardian of the reef appears. It is abnormally large, and Andre's thinking he should have left Ryan on board. But it's too late for that now. Ryan is already on his way down. This five meter female shark is exceedingly curious. Andre knows he can't risk taking his eyes off her. So far, the shark is calm and offers the cameraman some great shots. Ryan is fascinated by the shark. His receiver will have to wait. Great White seems to test each diver, selecting its victim. It even approaches Mark's cage. its hunting circles, guarding the divers very carefully. The game of cat and mouse has begun. is becoming more and more aggravating. The divers start to feel hot in the cool water. The cameraman uses his experience to fend off the female shark, but everybody knows that the time has come. by himself, without any means of protection. Andre swims quickly towards him to cover his back, but it's too late. This shark has just made its choice. 
Andre swims as hard as he can and hits the monster with his camera. The gigantic female responds immediately. She abandons her prey and swims off into a blue infinity. Back home in Port Elizabeth, Mark is reviewing the shots of his great adventure near Dyer Island. He keeps rewinding the footage from Andre's camera. He realizes that even the most feared of ocean predators may be more cautious than a human being. Perhaps it was all just an innocent game, interrupted by one ordinary human encounter. Mark's new friends, Ryan Johnson and Andre Hartman, have undoubtedly opened up a better way for him to understand this unknown and unexplored world. A world whose rhythm and balance are governed by the invincible powers of sea and ocean. A world which is being conquered and devastated by man in a desperate effort to expand his dominions. This is a world full of mysteries whose depths stay hidden behind a veil of secrets and myths. And one of these myths is the myth about the feared master of the seas. A myth that might have gone on striking fear into our hearts needlessly for centuries to come. <laughs>